Confidential and I'm here in the Greek and Roman Gallery of the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge talking to Dr Kate Cooper who's a research associate at the Fitzwilliam Museum and she's been involved in the redisplay of the Greek and Roman Gallery um, that reopened to the public in January 2010, that's right isn't it? Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, maybe you could start off by telling us why did the gallery need to be redisplayed? <laughs> well, basically, because it was old. Um, the last major display was done 40 years ago, give or take, and um, basically we think that permanent displays should have a shelf life of about 25 years, right? because of changing fashions in display techniques, in conservation and restoration techniques, and also just advances in security, in lighting. Mm -hmm. um, the specific problem with this gallery, in the old display, um, was that the visitor circulation patterns were quite difficult. Uh, the old display had showcases dividing up the whole room into bays right. with a central corridor that ran straight from the Cyprus Gallery on one end to the Egypt Gallery on the other, which meant that we had a lot of um, visitors walking straight through the Greek Ah, Island. without stopping to have a look in the other bays. Yes, exactly. Yeah. This was something we wanted to change, obviously, and I think we succeeded. Definitely, because you can't walk straight through now, <laughs> can you? Really? Yes, we put it <laughs> There are various obstacles, <laughs> obstacle course through the Greek and Roman Gallery. So um, we've opened up the architectural. Yes, room, I think, oh, it, I mean, it's, it's absolutely beautiful, and the lighting's amazing as well. Roughly, how many people were involved in the, the redisplay of the gallery? Ooh, lots. Um, because we have both the AHRC research project and the physical display, we are actually involving a huge number of people, mm. despite the fact that this museum is very small, yes. and so it's mostly done in the Antiquities Department. So we have our museum team, which consists of curators, two curators, two conservators, two technicians, basically, mm -hmm. that's the core. Um, but then we were getting in specialists, specialist stone movers from right. the last pieces of stone, uh, showcase manufacturers, obviously, a designer to think about the overall concept, um, plinth manufacturers, steel workers to help with the mounting of the objects, and that's all just for the uh, practical side. Yes. And then with the concepts and arrangement and label side, we had this co collaboration with the Faculty of Classics. Uh, in particular, it was Robin Osborne, mm -hmm. uh, Carrie Vout and Mary Beard, mm -hmm. who were our partners in this. Mm -hmm. Um, and who advised on label text and some of the stories that we were telling within mm. each case or each area mm. and who are continuing to work with us now on, for instance, developing our website um, capabilities yes. as well. And have you been having um, lots of students from the Classics faculty come to visit? Yes, especially when I bring them in here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my role is has been partly practical but has been partly a bridge between classics and museums uh -huh. because I've had background in both yes. and so I have been teaching over the last few years um, specifically museum oriented uh, courses in antiquities mm -hmm. so we're trying to re-tie the department, the classics faculty into the museum to use it as a resource yes. because it's something that despite being a university museum we suffer from a little bit, yes. we don't get the students in here well, that sounds like a very good thing. So, um, should we go and have a look at some of the cases and you can tell us more about them? So, although we have a loosely chronological framework, we are trying to emphasise certain themes. And amongst them, we are bringing out sort of people stories that attach to the objects, which is something that hasn't been done so much in the past, because what it does is it gives us a life history of the objects. Um, we're talking about the ancient uh, craftsmen who make them, the ancient users, but also the modern history, I say modern, uh, post-excavation history, so where they were found, who collected them, how they were restored and conserved. And so really trying to bring it up to date. And here we have a case that's talking about several of these themes in relation to Greek vases. So particularly attic vases. Um, we start by talking about the techniques of vase decoration and our gateway objects um, on this panel are um, talking about that. But we also are 
concern with bringing out restoration history, because really this is affecting how we as academics are seeing these objects, and sometimes we don't really realise what's going into um, the appearance of the objects. So here, number 34, as you can see this lovely cup, um, we're actually highlighting the different stages of restoration it's been through and how it has changed in its appearance. Only a small detail, but it is a detail that's crucial to um, how it appears today. So we're trying to do that both with vases and with sculpture throughout the gallery, just give an impression of the whole life of the object. So here, um, we were particularly concerned with showing the sort of archaeological um, past of some of our pieces. These are not terribly art-worthy in their own right. They're often not displayed. As you can see, we've got lots of little pieces of lead and um, rather crude little pieces of pottery. But they are crucial from an academic point of view because they're all coming from one context, the Sanctuary of Artemis Orthia at Sparta. And so they're all found together. A lot of museums have a huge collection of this in their stalls, as do we. And we wanted to get some of it out there, but just give the impression of the amount that we've got and what sorts of things this can tell us. So one of the real challenges we have with the practical side of this gallery was um, mounting some of the large stone pieces. Uh, this is something that took a lot longer than we were expecting, it was a lot more difficult, a lot more thought had to go into it. In the old display, a lot of these pieces were still on display, but they had been set into a false wall, so all you saw was the face. We wanted to make you see the entire object as an object. I mean, as you can see, there are several different depths of object. We were also concerned with keeping the mounting uh, mechanism reversible, because this is something that is very important these days, that everything is very uh, completely reversible. Uh, an example of how standards have changed, basically. To do this, with these particular slabs, we had to bring in a team of steel workers. So every single slab has a custom-made steel mount. Difficulty with this was that the steel workers couldn't take the objects out of the museum. They also couldn't bring their steel working equipment into the museum. There was no facilities for steel working in the museum. So they had to make it up from templates that we sent them and then come and fit each individual piece to the object, work out how it didn't fit, go back, adjust it. Very long process. But what we've come up with is this innovative solution for being able to demount the objects if we need to. And I hope that what we've managed to achieve is something that's fairly minimal while still being secure and reversible. Uh, here we have some of our Greek funerary monuments and one of the design features, in fact one of the specialties of our designer was his ability to use what we call them traffic lights, for want of a better word, this kind of uh, arrangement of a steel post. So this is why we chose him and I think it's worked really well. So this gallery wasn't a new build, I mean as you can see it's a very old um, gallery and in fact it's very well listed which gave us a real problem with the lighting. If you look up you can see that we've got a, a series of spotlights on the beams which are highlighting each of the pieces of sculpture because we couldn't put a central uh, light in because of the listing. Uh, so listing buildings, listed buildings consent wouldn't allow us to put central lights in and so we had to develop these innovative solutions. I think it's worked very well, it's very stylish. <laughs> okay, so if you had to pick one object from the whole gallery as your favourite, which one would it be and why? Well, my um, specialty is early Greek pottery, um, particularly Corinthian pottery, that's what I did my PhD in, so that's my background and I'm particularly pleased with uh, a piece that we've got here. It doesn't look like much, it's a, a Corinthian bottle mm -hmm. and it shows a, a festival of women Mm -hmm. um, in two decorative friezes around the outside. It's an unusual shape and I'm very happy we've got one in this collection because not, it's not a common shape, they don't appear in many collections. Um, but what's particularly significant about the shape is it tends to turn up in sanctuaries yes. and this is showing a festival uh, scene at a sanctuary. It looks unimpressive mm -hmm. but the story behind it is quite key. Yeah. Brilliant.